The following program does not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Reality Radio 101, its advertisers and sponsors, or its listening audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Beer Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker, Dr. Anna Baranowski. To contact us live right now, dial 905-725-1907. Toll free anywhere in North America, 1-866-905-7325. Worldwide, 1-866-656-5477. Send us an email right now. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. And now we're broadcasting from Toronto, Ontario on Reality Radio 101. Get ready to talk, email, or post a message to us. We are looking forward to speaking with you or to respond to your questions. Dr. Baranowski's work on trauma, relationships, stress, and mood have been featured on television, radio, and print. And now, ladies and gentlemen, your host of the Beer Psychology Radio Show, Dr. Anna. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad that we get a chance to speak today. I really want to kind of help you understand things from my perspective that, you know, in doing a lot of work over the years with individuals who struggled with many different um, emotional disturbances, whatever the source, that I've found that the most profound changes occur when a person truly feels heard and understood. I kind of like to think of it as deeply bearing witness to life evolving. We can feel incredibly stuck when we live our lives with our fears and stressors and troubles alone. And when we share dialogue and feel supported, it provides a powerful foundation for us to move forward in understanding and care. Isn't it time for your evolution? We are really fortunate because we have had an opportunity to hear from a number of different people already. Um, you know, we've had a very sad week in Toronto, something that most people didn't expect. Um, we live in a fairly safe city, and really there are things that can happen anywhere. But in the last week, we've had a really terrible tragedy, and um, one, of our, one of our listeners has already sent in a question, and uh, this came from Lorraine. And Lorraine asks, we're all traumatized by people losing their lives and suffering terrible injuries from the speeding van on Monday. This was April the 23rd, um, nine, uh, 2018. I'm worried about the people that tried to save the injured, stayed with the deceased, and anyone that witnessed this or the aftermath. Could you touch on this when you're interviewed? Uh, and um, uh, Lorraine wants to uh, hear a little bit about our thoughts on, on this issue. And I have obviously given it quite a bit of thought. I've been hearing from a lot of people throughout the uh, last few days and um, you know what what we recognize is really a kind of typically quiet strip of Young Street um, was suddenly the site of a really terrible tragedy and uh, I feel quite saddened by the events of April the 23rd where the suspect of really terrible act of destruction 25 year old Alec Manassian stepped into a rider van with the intent of using his vehicle as a weapon to harm others. And I'm really sad for the quiet North York community 
Whereas I keep hearing these things don't happen, but clearly they do, and we're not really immune to any of this, wherever we are. You know, there was an assumption of safety, and that's been shattered for a lot of people. I'm saddened for those families who've lost loved ones or faced terrible injury. But I'm really wondering, once again, why is it that this act of violence seemed like some kind of answer to Mr. Manassian? Why did he feel so disenfranchised, confused, and without a meaningful way to deal with this inner pain that he turned to such an extreme act of violence? And this, to me, continues to be such a crucial question. As terrible acts, once again, tear through another community, what is it about this desperation that leads young men to undertake such a vicious act? Police are saying it's too soon to make any conclusions about the motivations of his actions. But, you know, where is the sense of being part of a larger human community, focusing on kindness, on generosity, on meaning? You know, what, what was happening for Mr. Manassian that this was his answer and that it was something to tear people apart? and leave a sense of terror and confusion. You know, what are we actually missing in our communities that a man can't find solace, understanding, and connection, but instead chooses violence and meaningless destruction? For those who've been shaken up by these terrible events um, on Monday, just be aware that this type of event can have a very uh, a, a startling impact on your sense of s safety, and it can ignite your nervous system to turn on a fight or flight or even freeze response that leaves you feeling really exhausted and hopeless. And it, you know your body is actually wired to respond in this way to get you out of harm's way, even when danger's passed. And this means that you know you can feel on very high alert, feel very depleted, uh, f and even frightened for days. And after an event like this, our startled response can be very um, reactive to you know, sudden or loud noises. It can react very powerfully, unexpectedly. And if you've had a personal trauma history, then it can be even more ignitable. So um, you know, if you've been exposed to something that's very disturbing today, it can remind you of something that happened in the past. So your own nervous system can become very ignited. You can feel very at risk, even when the risk has passed. So please do keep that in mind. Um, it's time to really be gentle with yourself, to walk, drink water, seek out kindness from those in your life. Find ways to remind yourself that what's important is, you know, community and kindness and love. Like these are pretty standard things that we all need in order to feel stable in our lives. And just recognize that you might feel more fragile emotionally and that this is a normal response to exposure to a really threatening event. And what happened on Monday was startling and threatening and unexpected and can really, really undermine your feeling of well-being overall. We need to be really gentle and understand that you know you have to take care of yourself and those in your life and an act like this doesn't mean that you're always at risk, but your body, mind, nervous system can feel on edge for days. So put it in context. After these types of incidents, you can feel like you're constantly scanning your environment for potential risks. And just understand that from an evolutionary perspective, it's a safety response that will need time to settle down. It really does take time and, and actually because there's a lot of hormones that are streaming through your body, you will actually need time for the body itself to settle and that is a normal response. It can keep you up at night because you're in a state of uh, strain. So just continue to focus on being part of your community, find ways to feel like you belong, bring meaning into your day even in the simplest of ways. You know, be kind to somebody, be understanding of someone struggling, including yourself, and be gentle with yourself and those around you. These can be really tough times, and they demand we respond with great compassion, both to yourself and those around you. It's, it's so interesting to me because there's so many people who talk about getting frustrated with themselves when they've been exposed to something that's actually really hard. 
and you know and then instead of being kind to themselves and recognize this is such a tough thing to face um, they kind of develop this battle a personal uh, torture chamber a battle with oneself instead of being gentle with yourself which is what I'm suggesting you you might find yourself slipping into a pattern where you're being really hard on yourself and expecting more than you know maybe is reasonable right now so you know again take that into consideration and figure out ways that you can actually use this time to lean into the place where you can be gentler and dr anna why are you saying that let me let me tell the listeners again if you want to get a hold of dr anna right now live you can do that several ways our local telephone number in toronto or the gta area is 905 725-1907, toll-free, anywhere in North America, we will pay for the call, 1-866-905-7325. If you'd like to send us an email direct to Dr. Anna right now, our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. If you have a question or you have been curious about something, uh, something that's on your mind, something in the mood, something that matters to you, Please contact us and speak to Dr. Anna right now. Thank you, Gary. Mm -hmm. Um, What was your question, Gary? You you just asked me something. Uh, No, you you do. You have a comment on an email, but uh, I just wanted to let folks know if they have any type of a question to do with uh, their mood, something on their mind, or something that matters to them to to call in. We Mm -hmm. want them to do that. But could I read something here? Mm -hmm. There's something here that we want to promote and that is trauma practice for healthy communities uh, is a charitable organization and this organization is based in the heart of north york at young and shepherd in toronto and these folks are dedicated it's a dedicated team that is helping trauma survivors along with their families find a safe place to land with innovative and professionally facilitated group support programs and resources And these fine folks are there to help. If anyone out there wishes to find out more about the programs of the Trauma Practice for Healthy Communities, it's very simple. And and they need donations. They need community support. So what they can do is they can contact these fine folks at traumapractice.org or on canadahelps.org. Together, we are a community that can heal. That's the Trauma Practice for healthy communities right here in Toronto. Thank you. So Shane, um, thanks so much for your comment. Yeah, I am also really saddened about the tragedy in Toronto. I don't know where you're located and if you're local to the area. Um, you know, certainly I think it's it's good that you're reaching out. I think one of the things that can happen when people experience real tragedy is sometimes they can become very isolated and I think that is a terrible risk factor. I think that when people do become isolated they find themselves in a position where that loneliness can really turn in on a person and they can experience what I'm coining traumatic loneliness which is really it's kind of a work in progress but it's uh, the whole concept is that you know, when we experience something very upsetting, especially if there's a, a, an element of it that's human design, that we can become more and more isolated. We can become very confused, depressed, and anxious. And as we know that uh, depression and anxiety actually worsens when we are socially isolated, that um, we kind of arrive at conclusions that may be very far from being actually true. Um, You know, and and here's some thoughts that I have on this idea of traumatic loneliness, that people can arrive at a notion that um, life and people are dangerous. And the reality is, is that, you know, there is so much good out there, and we have to actually keep our eyes on the the people and the kindness that already exists in our communities. And there is a lot of that. But when we see these kinds of events, like what happened on Monday, we can use that one event to actually inform us of um, risks that go much, much beyond that one, really, I think it was 25 minutes in total. And when we realize you know, these things are very, very rare in general, and we want to actually be focused on how do you raise um, kind of the meaningful communi- community and connection in your life 
um, because it acts as a tremendous buffer. Um, it's one of those um, remarkable things that when you have people in your life who you really can rely on or who you feel uh, you know are able to show you some signs of kindness that it can really lower your feeling of stress and anxiety and depression it can really make you feel like there is hope um, another thing that I see with traumatic loneliness is that um, an individual may not feel like they can trust their own choices so uh, kind of a sense of you know do I really rely on myself? Can I, can I make the right choices? You know, a, am I feeling confident that if I do one thing or another that I, I'm going to be making choices that I can trust? And I think, you know, one of the best ways to actually do that is to actually test and to actually know. And I, I, I like to think about life as being mission-driven. So if you can connect inside of yourself and actually kind of test you know, what do I really believe in? What what are my best kind of views of the world around me? You know, what, what would I like to see happen in the world around me? You know, sometimes that could be a great guide in terms of being mission driven, you know, kind of find a place, uh, a, a kind of a core that you believe has deep value and meaning and let that be the driver. Um, we have Frank Burnett in New York City saying uh, interesting show listening in New York City and I'm um, glad to uh, have you with us Frank if you have any questions or you want to join us in the conversation we'd be happy to do that as well um, and I'm going to continue with this whole idea of traumatic loneliness um, this there's this really scary place that people can come from where this loneliness can kind of follow us around um, with this idea, I might be able to um, relate to other people, have, you know, a casual conversation, but I don't feel like anybody's close. And so if we have a lot of our own um, boundaries up, if we are constantly on guard, then it, it really is hard for people to get close to us as well. So yeah, it, it, sometimes developing those closer connections actually means being able to sit with people and let them see you and that can be very scary if we don't trust ourselves and so you know really really nice way to do that and uh, Gary was talking before about the trauma practice is finding community-based um, programming to come together with other people and it could be people who've also experienced trauma or different mental health issues have struggled with um, you know their own emotional strain but there's something very interesting that can happen when we have these honest conversations and we start to show people who we really are we don't feel so alone and we don't feel quite so different because the reality is, is and I've talked to a lot of people there's a lot of similarities when people have experienced emotional strain or injury in life there's a lot of commonality there's there's a lot of places where you don't have to feel quite so different because in so many ways we're actually very similar in our worries and fears and concerns um, another way in which traumatic loneliness can get in the way of um, relating is in this statement. This, these are actually statements that I've collected over the years. When I, when I do make a connection, it results in um, not a happy or healthy relationship. So just this sense of like, who, who am I attracting to myself? You know, am I, am I making choices? Are, are people who are attracted to me or connecting with me you know, also, you know, struggling so much that they are not able to relate in a functional way, in an organized way, and, you know, what happens. Um, and I, I'm really a big believer in working on our communication skills and, and actually taking responsibility for that piece of it. You know, what does it actually take for us to relate in a meaningful way with other people um, and, you know, really make a difference in in how we connect sometimes really relies on us working on our own skills to build our sense of um, you know um, kind of coming from a calm and stable um, state so sometimes that means actually learning how to settle down our own nervous system work on our own stress reactions so that when we're relating to somebody we actually feel like you know we can be calm we can feel like we're just having a simple conversation. 
Um, Alice uh, just tuned in, and she's asking us where we're located, and we are in uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And uh, Alice, if you want to uh, speak with us or have a conversation, then you can always reach out um, North America wide at one 905 7325 or 1-866-656-5477. And Alice is asking, um, she's saying loneliness is a ter- ter- terrible, yes, mental state, and I have been there. And I think, Alice, that everybody has been there. I don't think that loneliness is such an unusual thing. I've actually got a copy of Sebastian Younger's book in front of me. It's called Tribe, and it is actually one of my favorite books. It was written by a um, journalist who actually has done um, some... Uh, work as an embedded journalist in Afghanistan. He's he's actually quite an interesting fellow. I've had a conversation with him, and he he writes quite a bit about trauma and uh, about what it takes when people get together and start to connect, um, and how sometimes it's difficult times, times when people are in um, great trauma themselves that they can feel most connected. And one of the things that he discovered when he was working um, with um, um, the tribes, uh, the, sorry, the troops in Afghanistan was that um, when people came home after their deployments, they felt very disconnected, whereas when they were on deployment, they felt like they were part of literally a tribe of people who really had their backs and that they can turn to the right and the left and really feel like they were always surrounded by people who were really kind of paying attention to who they were, um, who really cared. But when they came home, they felt disenfranchised, they felt disconnected, they felt alone and confused. And sometimes it's in the times that we face the greatest hardships that we feel the most connected. And actually, there are periods of times where people are less likely to develop post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, stress, because um, there's that feeling of um, connection, and that is an incredible buffer. So, you know, I, um, I really like this use of um, connecting into the community, and I, I, I like an idea of finding different ways to connect that can be very meaning, meaningful. So, for example, um, if there are groups that you can connect with that all have a social um, component, um, whether it's getting together um, and joining a book club or uh, being part of a group of people who get together regularly and playing games together or exercise together or do something that is artistic or creative, um, you know, I really want to encourage you to find ways to go into the community around you and um, connect and just be part of something that it goes beyond yourself. Um, and here we have a question from Andy Crown. Um, can you please tell us a bit about yourself? Um, what are your specialties and how did you get into psychology? Do you have a website where you practice? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Hi, Andy. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a psychologist and I have been working very largely with a trauma since uh, about 1999 or something like that. 1997, actually, um, when was when I first started to, to really look at this work. And it's really been uh, a very strong focus of the work that I do clinically. I am in Toronto, and I largely focus on trauma in my private practice. It's something that I've been working with for many years. I've written two books. One is um, The uh, Trauma Practice, uh, and um, it is actually focused specifically on an approach that is a triphasic approach to help trauma survivors very specifically work with three phases. And the first phase is really stabilization or harnessing calm. It's an opportunity for people to better understand what does it really take to lower the volume of stress, to lower the impact on your nervous system when you've experienced something really impactful, we really have to be able to turn down the volume because what ends up happening is we get flooded with all these hormones. They impact us, our body, our mind, our nervous system, and it could really get embedded in our brains so that, you know, anytime we have a reminder of something that was disturbing to us, we can get a full-on bells and whistle in ignition 
um, that can make us feel like we're living through the trauma again right now, even if it happened in the past. This is why, you know, with the events of last Monday, people who've experienced a trauma historically in their own uh, past can have those traumatic memories start to replay today, even though they may not have even um, been in the uh, core where the incident was occurring at the time. You know, you can just learn about it and it can reignite your own uh, sense of vulnerability. So it can be pretty profound. The other thing about trauma practice is that um, the, the second phase is working through trauma. So, you know, we take the time to really understand what are the kinds of events that an individual has encountered, um, what kind of impact did those stories have on them, and then we start to really look very, very closely at working through the memories themselves, and there are many different really great approaches for doing that and really good clinicians who know how to do that. So if trauma is something in your history, Andy, then, you know, one of the things that you might want to consider is working with somebody who's a very trauma-informed care practitioner who can really um, help you work through the kind of the, the stories themselves. Um, and I, as I said, like the triphasic approach where you're really um, settling down um, the nervous system or harnessing calm, working through the trauma using a wide variety of different approaches. Um, we use many different approaches in our clinic um, and then the third phase is really kind of an integration phase where you're really working on strategies to, you know, come back into the world and be part of the things that are most important to you in terms of feeling connected and feeling like, you know, you're, you're living a life that's meaningful. And part of that is, I believe, to a large degree, being part of a community and connecting with people and feeling like you are uh, relationships matter and that people are actually caring about you and that you're caring about others. It, it's an incredible buffer. It's probably one of the most important things that I think that we can do. And, you know, as um, I was mentioning before with the Sebastian Younger book, Tribe, you know, just this idea that, you know, it's not necessarily just terrible times that create um, a risk of uh, developing post-traumatic stress or a stress uh, response or disorder, but the isolation can be incredibly undermining in terms of our well-being overall. Um, hi, Kyle. Um, are, are your books still available? And if so, uh, where can we purchase them? So thanks so much. That's such a, such a, such a nice question. Um, so yes, uh, both of the books are still on the market. One is called um, Trauma Practice. Uh, tools for stabilization and recovery that's really a clinician's book and it's uh, it's a great book for people who are looking for strategies to uh, work with individuals who've experienced trauma and the other book is what is PTSD three steps for healing trauma and that's available as well and um, and that's really you know a book that helps an individual who's experienced trauma understand the impact different strategies for addressing that. And actually, um, one of the things that we can do today, Gary, is that we can um, give away some copies of the uh, Trauma Recovery Program, which is our online trauma program. Now, it is not a, um, uh, it's, it's not a replacement for direct trauma therapy. Like if, if you've experienced something really difficult in your life, I really do encourage that you find a skilled professional care with a trauma-informed care practitioner. I think that's really important. But if you're looking to better understand the impact of you, on you, if you've been exposed to something traumatic or you're trying to make sense of what's happened to a friend or a loved one and the impact on them, then the Trauma Recovery Program can be a really great tool. It's online and it's available at whatisptsd.com. So that's whatisptsd.com. That's one of our websites. And um, Gary, if anybody um, emails and wants a copy of that, then um, certainly we can. Sure, um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let me let me just give a quick promo here, folks. If you're just tuning in, you are listening to the Bear Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker. 
Dr. Anna Baranowski, right here live on Reality Radio 101. If you have a question for Dr. Anna, it's very simple to get a hold of us. If you want to just send us an email, our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. That's instudio101 at gmail.com. If you'd like to call, if you're in the Toronto GTA area of Southern Ontario, Canada, you can call us at 905-725-1907. Anywhere else, toll free, one 866 905-7325. So right now, think about it. You have an issue. Something's on your mind. Something is affecting your mood. Something matters to you and you need to talk to someone. Well, we have the answer right now. Dr. Anna Baranowski, live in the studio. Send us an email right now, in studio 101 at gmail.com. Oh, thank you, Gary. So, again, if people are interested, um, like our friend here, Kyle, um, if Kyle would like to get a copy of the Trauma Recovery Program, since he has already um, emailed in, then certainly um, we can make that available for him. And, uh, you know, if people are interested in continuing the conversation around what we've encountered in Toronto recently, I also want to talk a little bit about what it takes to reduce stress and, you know, the kinds of things that people can sometimes experience you know, even when they are just listening to something on the news. And we actually have Tamara here. Um, and I know Tamara and I had a conversation earlier today, and she was telling me that um, because our office was very, very close to the events, we could hear the um, sirens blaring for hours. We could see the helicopters um, above head. And um, Tamara, you were just telling me that you were you were actually out um, right at Young and Shepherd. Um, and you could hear and see the helicopters, and uh, you, at that point, we didn't really know what was going on at that moment, um, just that we were hearing it. So what was that like for you? That's right. I was out, uh, like a, most of us, enjoying the beautiful first day of spring and sunshine and warmth, and uh, thought maybe I would sit down and, and have my lunch outside. And then I suddenly... Um, saw a helicopter north and thought, oh my gosh, something must be going on. And then sirens and ambulance and fire trucks and police cars came in at such a rate of speed that I hadn't ever really seen in Toronto. And my response was to go back to the office. Yeah. Um, and then when I was back up in the office, I continued to hear sirens nonstop for the next little while. And uh, obviously something had happened that was quite serious. Yeah, it was it was really impossible to know what was going on. I was actually, you were in the office, I was actually sitting with clients and we could hear this um, ongoing traffic and nobody really knew what was going on. And because largely my clients are trauma survivors, even hearing the sirens in the background would have been very distressing. That's right. But I know that, you know, you were saying that even... <clears throat> after the fact, even though, you know, you didn't see anything other than the, the um, helicopters overhead and you could hear the sirens, you went home and you, you noticed that um, it, this was having an effect on you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I think, um, you know, you want to know what, what happened, so you tune in to the news, of course, and uh, my husband and I were sitting watching the news, and, and of course there was not a lot of information immediately, but... Uh, it's very disturbing, and you feel like you were so close. And even if you weren't or haven't had previous trauma, um, you, it's running through your mind about your loved ones and how anyone may have been affected by it directly or indirectly. And it's it left me feeling upset and, uh, and sick to my stomach, and I didn't sleep very well. Yeah. So it and see, that's exactly the kind of thing that I, I think about when, you know, people talk about the kind of impact, even even if you don't have a trauma background yourself, even if you don't have a trauma history, it's it's almost like the body goes into this state of preparation. And so it because you get a hormone dump the adrenaline and the cortisol and what ends up happening is that these hormones can actually first hormone that will kind of really hit you is the adrenaline and that kind of it burns like um like dry wood it's like really fast 
and it kind of prepares you. You sit at the edge of your seat. You kind of galvanize all of your energies, um, and then it kind of goes away fairly quickly. But when there's no let up, like there was no let up on that right. day because the news was coming in and then the sirens kept blaring and you kept on hearing things. Helicopters weren't going away. You knew something was really, really wrong. And mm -hmm. there was a lot of st stimulus, a lot of um, signs that um, you had to keep on being aware of throughout the day. It just didn't go away. So at that point, it's cortisol that comes into play. And cortisol actually burns much more slowly in the body. And mm -hmm. what ends up happening is you can have this feeling like <clears throat> the volume of stress just never turns down. It never turns down. It never turns down. And then like you said, it it just didn't go away and it was hard for you to sleep. It's like the volume of stress just wasn't going to turn off right away. And so you have to start preparing yourself for um, using different strategies to help you turn down the volume and be very consistent with it and don't expect it to turn down and stay down on its own because sometimes you'll turn down the volume a little bit and it's like, okay, I could relax for a minute. But then it comes right back up again and that's the cortisol. It just mm -hmm. continues to keep you in a heightened state. And, and you know, from an evolutionary perspective, we de definitely want adrenaline and cortisol to be working because they get us out of harm's way mm -hmm. or they keep us alert along enough so that we can continue to be aware of threats if we need to and and that's a good thing it's just that you know it takes a lot of work to really turn down the volume I'm a really big believer in you know do you know if you're going to tell people what to do you better be well prepared to do it yourself and um, you know I'm always busy um, you know making sure that I practice different things that help me take care of myself because there's no way I could do my work um, you know spending so much time working with um, trauma and um, really focusing a lot on um, stress and anxiety um, relationship issues in my practice and although I love my work I couldn't do my work unless I was really really diligent about taking care of myself and so when I face a day like Monday and I can see that the volume is really high in terms of stress I will do what I ask every, anybody else to do. Really take your time and do all the different things that you need to do to tend to yourself. And having a practice that you use regularly, and I like to practice yoga, um, and I you know, do all sorts of different exercises as well. And, of course, I love to walk my dog. That's a good thing to do every day if you can. Your listeners want to know what kind of dog do you have? <laughs> <laughs> my dog is an amazing mix between a Bernese Mountain Dog and a Poodle, and he is supremely lovely at 120 pounds. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so if you A lot of food, too, huh? Exactly. You're, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we'll we'll make sure that uh, Jasper comes in and, and I'd visits. love to see Jasper. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'm, I'm sure he would love to see you, too, as well. That'd be great. Um, we also have Cody, and Cody is listening in Nashville, Tennessee, um, thank you so much, Cody, for reaching out to us. Cody says, my condolences go out to the wonderful people of Toronto. That very unfortunate incident was such a shock and unexpected. It just goes to show that we're not immune to these types of incidents anywhere in our world. Um, thank you for the show. Thank you, Cody. Thank you so much. And again, you know, uh, Cody, if you um, feel that the trauma recovery program would be something that you'd be interested in then um, Gary would be happy to provide that uh, for you or if you're just can you know interested in the whole topic of trauma and what happens to people then that's a really good resource because it certainly has a lot of um, different different types of um, tools embedded in the other thing that people might be interested in if you have an interest in stress and um, trauma and recovery and different ways to help with growth, you might go to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash what is PTSD and you can subscribe or like any of our videos. And I think we have like over 200 something videos there that talk about the issues in general and give you lots of tips and tools and strategies. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit of time as well and talk about different stress reduction practices since we've been talking a little bit about that. And thank you, Tamara, for sharing that experience and how you know even when you don't have a 
trauma background, it can really trouble you and, and keep you up. By the way, Absolutely. I'm just wondering, so you had trouble the first night sleeping. Did that go away? Yes, uh, it did. Uh, however, it surfaces again as we hear stories now of the victims and uh, how sad those and tragic situations. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I went to a yoga class that helped because uh, I do surround myself then with people that I, I know and trust and love and mm -hmm. that helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Putting yourself in a in a environment where the focus is really on, you know, taking care of yourself and doing something to help you become part of the the evolution of us actually being better overall. Okay, so I think that is a really beautiful thing that you're able to do that. So mm -hmm. you lowered the volume because you're practicing something, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, one of the biggest things. I mean, one of the things that <clears throat> is really important to keep in mind is that there's no one quick fix. I mean, get that out of your mind completely and totally forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no one quick fix. I think that people who tend to do the best in whatever it is, uh, whether it's managing stress, building communication skills, learning different practices for uh, relationship building. You know, all of those things are practices that you take on that you really, you know, work on day to day. Um, oh, hi, Cassandra. So Cassandra is asking, is exercise good for um I guess overall well-being and boy is it ever um, you know there's all sorts of you know, hormones that get released when we exercise and certainly I think if exercise can be bottled and sold it would probably be um, one of the the best things we can do for ourselves um, you know certainly I was talking a little bit about adrenaline and cortisol before and how when we are exposed to a stressor a trauma whatever something that really upsets and agitates us that um, it, it's actually movement that can help to uh, dissipate the, the kind of overwhelming feeling of uh, the hormones that are coursing through your body after a stressor or a trauma. So, you know, I would encourage if there is some way for you to exercise and to make that a really regular part of your day, that it is a pretty um, uh, helpful thing to do. Um, so I also want to talk a little bit about different strategies that you can employ that, you know, are really, I think, very helpful overall. And I want to refer a little bit to the YouTube channel that we have again, because there are some exercises that you can watch or listen to that could be very helpful, whether it's uh, learning how to um, manage your sleep. There's a whole section on sleep. Um, or you want to learn some strategies for, you know, settling down your nervous system with deep breathing and actually breathing practices can be incredibly helpful. Just taking your time and noticing how the breath moves in and out of the body as you inhale through your nose and exhale through your lips. And actually there's um, a box breathing exercise that I really like where you inhale very slow, smooth, and deep to the count of four. Hold to the pause of one. Exhale to the count of four. Pause to the count of one. And as you continue to do that, if you did it for five or ten rounds, and then just noticed, how are you feeling now? You might find that you can lower the volume of your stress just I'm by I'm doing changing. it now and falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. It's taking care of my stress. Yeah. You, how are you doing in there, I'm Gary? I'm fine. I'm, I'm taking this all in like a sponge. Oh, good. This is great. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. And it, you know what, folks? It's free advice. Take advantage of it. Give us an email. Write us write us right now. In studio one oh one at gmail dot com. In studio one oh one at gmail dot com if you would like to talk uh to Dr. Anna or if you have a question, we're here to help you right now. Thank you so much, Gary. And again, I just want to remind people about the trauma practice um and just the fact that trauma practice is charity and it is actually just by chance happens to be in the heart of uh, North York, right where this very incident has happened. And one of the biggest mandates of the trauma practice is to really develop group 
based programming for individuals who'd like to come together in community and be able to find a supportive environment where they can feel that they are learning what they need to learn to work through their own trauma history or they have an opportunity to connect with others and feel less isolated and more connected, heard, and understood. And I think that, as I said before, is one of the uh, greatest buffers. It's amazing how people can feel when they just get the sense that, yeah, my experience is not so unusual. And, you know, what I've experienced is a normal response to something really difficult. Um, whatever that story is, whatever that history is, you know, to recognize that, you know, sitting in isolation can leave us feeling very desperate. And somehow we have to break up that loneliness and desperation and create community and um, solutions. So I would also encourage if people have um, had an opportunity to look into maybe a meditation group where they can learn about slowing down the busyness of your mind because sometimes you know you can get yourself into a whirl and a spin in kind of a lot of negative thinking that can really kind of head you in the wrong direction so you want to really be aware of how powerful the mind is and how easy it is for us to get off track with a lot of <coughs> oh, excuse me I'm still getting over a cold um, with a lot of negative thinking and we want to be able to really break that up and not um, believe all the negative things that might come to our minds. It could be a habit of thinking or an old belief that um, that is intruding and we don't want um, these kind of negative belief systems to overwhelm us um, or take us in direction that um, is not really necessarily true. <coughs> I'm going to let Gary give us another round of um, uh, information about the trauma practice. We, we do have a <laughs> caller for you. Diana is on the line, and she said that she has a question for you. So, Diana, go ahead, please. Hi. I'm so glad that I um, found out about you um, because when I was a teenager, I was diagnosed with... I'm in my 40s now. I was diagnosed with um, depression and anxiety, and just recently I just happened to see a flyer about something, and then I found out about the PTSD, and I feel like that the diagnosis was completely wrong, and everything that I found out about the PTSD is everything that I've, like, been experiencing for the past, I would say, like, the, the 20 it's like 20 years now so what you were talking about with the um what is it the, the trauma loneliness or all of that i just that is just so real so um in therapy i believe that ptsd is not on the what is it the d the dsmv or something like that so how do you get treatment for that if that's not necessarily on you know what I'm saying? Oh, do, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Those are th actually you've got a lot of important things that you're saying right now. First of all, I want to really um, acknowledge that your experience is not unusual, that in fact, a lot of people um, have been misdiagnosed with depression and anxiety when in fact the correct um, diagnosis is post-traumatic stress disorder now, I'm not going to ask you what happened to you that you've developed post-traumatic stress disorder, but just the fact that you've had an opportunity to do some um, kind of inquiry and realize that uh, PTSD is probably a more accurate uh, diagnosis, right away you're on, you know, you're on a better track because I think it's very, very easy for people to spend a lot of time um, you know, searching out what they can do to feel better. And if you don't know what's really wrong, it's really, really hard to get the right treatment. So I think, you know, probably you um, live in a city that's large enough that you can do some searching around for clinicians who've ex who have experience as um, trauma-informed practitioners. I think that's such an amazing thing if you could find somebody who really knows how to deal with that specifically because there are a lot of great tools today that, you know, really people weren't using 20, 30 years ago. And there's a lot of research and a lot of really strong um, new approaches that can help people pretty quickly 
with uh, trauma experience. Um, Diana, I think you were referring to the DSM-5. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's the Diagnostical Statistical Manual. It's the fifth edition. And in fact, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder is definitely part of the DSM-5. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure who you spoke with um, who finally helped to put you in the right direction, but I think that's pretty great. Are you working with a clinician who's I- able to help you with PTSD now? Yeah, because um, actually when I had found out um, about um, the posting, I just happened to, to just um, to just visit um, this group, and then I got directed to the actual book that I have. Um, and then that's when I was reading it, and it was just so, I just couldn't believe how specific it was about the different things that I had been experiencing and I just felt like it was just such a revelation and it was just so helpful because I feel like um, and one of the things that it talks about that you experience is loss of time and I feel like like all these years that I've just like experienced like just a total loss of time but like you were saying before about the community and the kindness and the love and just feeling like a connectedness now I just feel like now that I know specifically what it is, I really can, like, start living my life. And now I feel like I can, like, help other people because now you're, like, on my I'm, – I'm looking at everything that you have now. The reason how I found out about um, this today on the radio is because um, I signed up for the emails from your, from your website. So I just – I'm just so thankful for people like you because I truly feel that, um, like – and now I plan on like sharing this with my family, so I don't feel like all this time. Oh, she's been by herself. She's so strange. She's 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 like this. My mother at first thought I was bipolar, but it's I knew that it wasn't that. But now I feel like for people like you totally can under like understand. So I just wanted to try to figure out to put myself on the right path until I can find someone who is of the same understanding as you. Wow, that is a really <clears throat> kind of beautiful story, Diana. I'm really glad that you called in today. What was the book that you were reading that um, clarified so much of this? Um, let me see. It's called um, The Complex PTSD Workbook by Ariel Schwartz. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, when when you when you start to realize what what it is that's really going on and the language just makes sense and you start to understand that the symptoms that you're really struggling with are not something so unusual, but something that people feel and experience and that, yes, it really happens. And you are just somebody who's experienced something very tough. And this is a normal response as a result of being exposed to something terrible. Um, now, I wanted to ask you, you talked about loss of time. Were you talking about foreshortened future, like a sense that somehow you wouldn't be a, alive for a long time, or was there something else? What did you no, mean by loss I mean, of time? When I mean loss of time, I just, I mean, like, just, like, kind of not so much, I guess not necessarily why am I here, but just feeling like, um, because you know the symptoms that you feel with it, just feeling like um, kind of like no sense of direction, I guess. Um, like um, now that I, you know, specifically know what it is, I feel much better. But I think like as before, I guess just like no sense of direction. And I don't like, um, um, I haven't like been on medication or anything like that because I don't like the way it makes me look. But I don't even think it's medication now because, like, when I was, you know, first diagnosed with it, you know how the, um, what is it, the Zoloft and things like that. I just don't like the way that makes me look or feel. So I just have been doing, like, natural things, I guess, um, like things like teas and, like, exercise. And, you know, someone mentioned something about before about, you know, yoga. And I find that that, um, you know, it helps. But... I don't know. I just feel like everything is, I have so much work to do now because this, this diagnosis is just so much more specific as opposed to just being sad or anxious. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and it, it normalizes what's really going on. You can start to target more specifically what's happened to you. I'm just wondering, um, Diana, the, the, the clinician that you're working with, does that person have trauma training it's very specifically? Oh. Um, I don't. I don't know about trauma training, but the, that's the person who I found out about the book. So mm -hmm. I guess I have to like get more in depth about talking with them about it. Mm -hmm. But um, I know that they're um, they have credentials as you do yourself. They practice themselves. Yeah. Great. So, but I'm not no. I don't know if it's specifically what you do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Exactly. And there are many, many really good approaches to dealing with uh, trauma. But you know, some of the really good ones that. Uh, have had a lot of um, research done on them. Have you heard of um, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing EMDR? I've heard of it, but I never really knew what it was. So I, I would, didn't quite understand it. Yeah, so that's a really that's a really good approach. Um, we also work with something called thematic map and release and the trauma practice approach. Uh, now, I'm going to actually suggest, Diana, because I've got you on the phone, that before you get off the phone that you can talk to Gary and he's going to collect some information. And then if you would like to, we will give you a free copy of the trauma recovery program, which will give you access to um, <clears throat> a lot of the different interventions that we, we think are really interesting and just different ideas and uh, a better and deeper understanding of the impact that trauma might have had on you. Because I, I really believe that there is something very, very powerful like you've experienced, and I think you, you've really done a great job of expressing it, that just by learning and understanding that there is this thing called post-traumatic stress and that actually that's what's going on with you, that you feel more normal. Yes, I had no idea that it was even that. It just, I would have never thought of that at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then somehow you were lucky enough to come across somebody who pointed this out and started to put the connection t together for you, right? Which is such right. a beautiful it's thing. Of, it's kind of like when the doctor says that, you know, you're, you're experiencing this and you're experiencing that, but you're just not satisfied with, with that opinion and you continue to search and search and search until you actually find what it is, that's how I feel. Well, I'm really excited that you have actually searched and searched and searched because it sounds like it's been <laughs> a long search to get you to yeah. the point. Well, yeah. let's, yeah. let's Diana, could you hold on the line for a second? Because we're coming to the end of the show. And could you sure. just, uh, sure, and we'll take, if you'd like, we take some information from you and we can send you some resources. Would that be okay? I would love that. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. Just stay on the line for a couple of minutes, okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Anna, there you go. So we'll get all of Diana's information, and uh, we'll go from there. I just want to say we're coming, we're coming to almost the end of the show right now, and... We have about three minutes left. I want to thank you for coming on, and this is, we'll say, this is your f first show, hopefully of many, many more. And, folks, if you want to get a hold of Dr. Anna, Dr. Anna, where could people, your listeners around the world, get a hold of you if they have a question and they want to talk? Some email, websites, what do you have to promote? Well, so I think probably the best thing to focus on are the two main areas. One is the trauma trauma practice.org and if you feel that you're inclined to support the community-based programming and you want to donate um, even a small amount um, to make a difference in the community trauma practice.org um, to really focus on that it's not something that we benefit from directly but we're trying to give back to the community and that is one of our most important focuses right now and then for sure if people are interested in the trauma recovery program uh, at whatisptsd.com and certainly to subscribe to our YouTube channel because we are frequently updating and even today we have as I said before about 200 videos that are just filled with information and interviews lots of really interesting interviews with people who really focus on trauma and really focus on health and healing and recovery tips and tools and strategies after trauma so it is youtube.com what is PT 
SD. And it has been a delight speaking with all of you today. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is, before we go off the air, Tamara, say something to everybody. Tell everybody a little bit. How was your first experience on radio? Oh, it was uh, fantastic. Um, I'm nervous about it, but I, uh, I think that there's a lot that has been shared here today. And I think that Dr. Anna is amazing and a wealth of knowledge and compassionate. And I'm just learning so much. Okay. And Dr. Anna, your closing thoughts. It was a delight speaking with all of you today. Looking forward to meeting with you again, and I just wish you a gentle day. Very good. Folks, again, you have been listening to, now get this, you're ready for this, one of the, I can tell you it's going to be a great show, the Bear Psychology Radio Show with psychologist, author, and speaker, Dr. Anna Baranowski, right here on Reality Radio 101.